Thank you very much, Nova, and thank you um, to all the organizers for um, inviting me and for making this possible. Um, so, I'd like to um, say a few words to, to introduce the, the overall flow, and I'd also, as we do that, that would be a good time for some housekeeping. Earlier today, um, I introduced the informed consent for the filming. Um, I'd now like to hand out some clicker devices, and I'll explain how they work in a minute. So I'll invite my colleague Jules to pass over. You'll each get one. Please remember to give them back at the end of the day. Hillary will be very upset if I don't come back with them. Um, and as she does so, she will pick up the informed consent form from you. Okay? So hand it over and she, as she hands it over to you. Um, it's another piece of introduction. Um, I'll be presenting these materials to you today, but these are not materials that I alone develop. I'm standing here on the shoulders of giants, so to speak. So that's why you'll see on the cover slide of each module, many logos scattered there. So I'd like to now, as we start the day, to take a, a brief moment to acknowledge that. So you'll see, of course, the the Circa logo, right next to the description of the workshop that we have here. But you'll also see a range of logos on the bottom. So from left to right, there's the logo of the CGIR, which is the um, network that ILRI is a part of. ILRI is one of 15 research centers that together form the CGIR network. Um, you'll also see a CGIR research program on humid tropics. So the CRP on Human Tropics funded a lot of this work and also is applying this systematically throughout uh, three continents, so here in Asia, across Sub-Saharan Africa, and in uh, Central America and the Caribbean. So we'll have some examples from those, from those regions. Um, then, of course, my, uh, my parent institute, ILRI, the International Livestock Research Institute, based in uh, Nairobi, Kenya, where I'm based. So ILRI has been working on innovation systems and innovation platforms within that for many years now. So what I'll be sharing with you today is really just the tip of the iceberg in terms of ILRI materials. Um, all of our materials are freely available to you at any time. So we have an open access policy, which means everything we publish, everything we say, everything we do, um, makes it onto our open access repository and can be used by anyone for, for any means under a Creative Commons license. So if you see anything, then references, you can always see me, but you can also just go to ILRI's website and find everything there. Next is our sister organization from the CGIR, IITA, the International Institute for Tropical Agriculture. Um, and next to it, Wageningen University. So IITA and Wageningen have been partnering with us on much of this work, and you'll see many references to their work um, as we go through the day. In fact, you've already seen some references to the work in Bernie's presentation, and I'll come back to that later. Um, next is the FARA. FARA is the Forum for Agricultural Research in Africa. Um, so it's an umbrella organization coordinating a lot of the research throughout the continent. And lastly, that, uh, uh, I always wonder what that is. But that's the Royal Tropical Institute logo. So KIT, the Royal um, Tropical Institute, based in Amsterdam, the Netherlands. So the materials are drawn up from uh, all of these organizations. And uh, a lot of the insights that you will get come from them. If there are misrepresentations, they are entirely mine. Yeah? So that's, that's the way this, uh, this sharing works. Now, I also want to recognize a few individuals, because it's always nice to recognize the organizations, but organizations are composed of individuals after all. So, um, first and foremost, I'd like to recognize uh, Mark Schrutt from uh, IITA and Wageningen University, who uh, co-designed the initial workshop that led to much of this work together with me that we ran back in 2014. I'd also like to recognize uh, my colleague, Deborah Wyburn from ILRI, who's really taken the lead on most of the work that you see here. And if you'll go on and use these materials later and use the online course that comes with it, um, this is very much her creation. So all the credit goes there. 
Um, she's been assisted with uh, Solomon Shimelis, an Ilri Fellow, working on some of these materials. And there are many others who, I'm, uh, who I won't bore you with uh, at this stage, but this is the work of, of many people. Okay, so does everyone now have a clicker in their hand? Great. By show of hands, how many have used these clickers before? Okay, great. So, what do you think these clickers are for? For quiz responses, yes, absolutely. So you've, you've guessed it absolutely correctly. And the idea is that throughout the day, yeah, throughout the day, at various points, I will ask you questions. Now, normally, in a room full of people, when you ask a question, the first thing that happens is nothing. You know, everyone is very silent. But then as we get comfortable and we get to know each other a little bit better, you know, there may be two or three people who always have something to say. Yeah? And there'll be another five people who never want to um, voice their opinion. I find that um, not a good enough representation of the room. So this is a way where you can anonymously and instantly give me feedback. Yeah? So I can see whether the concepts are going across well or not. Yes? But also, so I have prepared some, there are some questions scattered throughout, but also we can at any given point say, any one of you can raise and say, can we do a poll on this? Yeah? And we'll just quickly type it in and we can vote on that. So it makes the experience more participatory. Yeah? So, shall we give it a try? So the first couple of questions, um, you didn't need to do any background uh, studying for, so I'm pretty sure you'll be able to answer them, especially since there's no right or wrong answer. For instance, who's in the room? So, please pick the category that best describes your primary affiliation. Now, many of you would say, well, um, I'm a government person, but I also do research, or I come from an NGO, but I also do extension. So, whatever you feel is your best description. Do you come from government extension? Press A or 1. Do you come from NGOs or civil society? Press 2. Research? Press 3 or C. And if none of the above, private sector or something else, you can press D for other. Okay? Simple enough, right? So I can see, and you can also see, let's see if this works, you see here? I can actually see the number of responses clicking in. So I can see that we're now up to, you know, up to 10. But that's not enough. We should have more. Yeah? So we have 21 so far. Okay? Pick the one that you feel the most affiliated with. Yeah? Now the way these clickers work, if you clicked on something and you want to change your mind, you can. It will remember the last thing you clicked. Yeah? So if anyone had a change of heart, they can quickly change it as well. Okay? Okay, so we see that we have a majority of the rooms, about two-thirds of the room, identifies as government or extension people. We also see that we have um, about a quarter of the room, slightly over a quarter of the room, primarily identifying as researchers. We have 9% of others. Completely optional, but would someone of the others like to define how they define themselves? Okay. And interesting, nobody here in the room identifies primarily as an NGO or civil society. So that's interesting for us to also keep in mind in our discussions that we have certain representation in the room. So we see the world through a, a certain lens. So let's remember in particular that there's a certain lens here that we don't have with us in the room today. Yeah? And let's try to be cognizant of that. So a similar exercise, again, who's in the room? I'd like you to describe what you feel is your exposure to innovation platforms. Is it something that you've never heard of? in which case you click A. Something that you've heard of, but you're not really, really sure what they are or how they function. Is it 
something you've worked with before and you feel you have a basic understanding? Or is it something that you've used extensively and you feel you have a strong grasp of the topic? Responses are coming in, we've got about 16. Now 20, 23, okay. Okay, so it's an interesting, but perhaps not surprising given the, the target audience. So an interesting mix. So we have very few of the extremities. You know, there's a, a, a few people who feel they've never been exposed to it, that will be completely new. But for most of you, you either have some exposure or you've heard of it, you'd like to know more and so on. So great, so hopefully if I poll you on this question again, by the end of tomorrow, you know, we'll get a very different set of answers. Yeah? Comfortable with the concept of polling? Great. The other reason I love clickers is because I'm, I'm an economist by training. And uh, so I firmly believe that people respond to incentives. Yeah? So I've now given you an incentive to pay close attention. Why? Because you know that you will be tested on what is being said throughout the day. So this is not an exercise where you can sleep through and nod and, and get through. Yeah? Okay. So in that case, let us, uh, let us begin our journey. So in terms of the core objectives uh, of this particular module, module one, um, we want to identify and examine some of the major features and characteristics of complex agricultural problems and explore innovative solutions to those. And also look a little bit under the circumstances where innovations emerge. Now I'm very fortunate to have had Bernie come up with the presentation before me because many concepts here he touched upon so I don't need to go uh, as much in depth. You'll actually see some identical slides and I promise you we did not pre-coordinate, so you're getting some triangulation here. First, let's look at complex problems in agriculture. Agriculture is in a really integral for both the physical and the economic survival of every human being. Yeah? We don't eat without agriculture. And agricultural problems are also very cross-cutting. They're multi-dimensional and multi-level and they involve many actors. And therefore the causes of the actual problems are also very complex. So it's a huge problem of complexity that we're dealing with. Agriculture needs to be sustainable. How many times have you heard that? Agriculture and sustainability said together in the same breath. All the time, I'm sure. Um, if we want to feed a growing planet, you may hear you know, how many mouths we'll need to feed by the year 2030, 2050, and so on, and so forth. So meeting the demands of a rapidly growing world um, remains a big challenge. In contemporary agriculture, it's not just a production. We also have to deal with the environmental issues, the ecosystems, biodiversity. We also have to look at the negative externalities of using toxic chemicals, etc. But agriculture remains on the healthy, functioning ecosystem. So we have a lot of um, positive and negative externalities that we need to manage. And this obviously contributes to the complexity of the issue we're trying to address here. We have a few disconnects that affect this issue very much. And I'll touch briefly on three of these in this first module. First is the disconnect between agriculture and the environment. The second is the disconnect between producer and consumers. And the third is the disconnect between policies and expectations. So on the first one, the human activities associated with agriculture have really made a big impact, and not always a positive one, on the environment. Whether it's uh, water, nitrogen cycles, climate change. They're all major issues that human activity that's associated with agriculture is playing a very big role in. And where if we're really looking at sustainability, we have to think about ways to address. 
The other thing is that if we look at farming methods, they've really degraded um, the quality of the soils. So that, for instance, through massive fertilizer use in order to get the yields. So that's one example of such a disconnect. And of course, when I say it like that, it can look very simple, but as the, uh, the simple graph, well, relatively simple graph, um, illustrates, you actually have um, many causes for this. So you have climate extremes, and you have natural hazards, and then this can lead to natural disasters. Of course, what we're primarily interested in in these cases is the quality of life. So all of these factors are interdependent, and that's part of the complexity of the issue. So the, the challenge, what we want to achieve is easier said than done a sustainable agriculture in a changing climate. But uh, as all of you know, if you're involved in policy setting or in implementing um, agricultural policies, that's really easier said than done. The second disconnect that I want to highlight is the disconnect between producers and consumers. So low prices that customers are willing to pay for, especially in food, um, is being compounded by a crisis of trust, by a crisis of trust in the quality of the foods, food safety issues, and so on. Then we have a range of food scares, whether it's mad cow or bird flu or things of that nature, which suddenly scare us from eating a certain type of food or a certain value chain is completely avoided. And a general sense that the supermarket foods, or generally the cheap foods that we find, are not of good nutritional value, which is not a wrong assumption to have, by the way. So we're, we're having a system where both sides are actually discontent. We have a disequilibrium. We also have a disconnect between policies and expectations. So Bernie showed us you know, a range of policies so every Asian country had um, its policy, whether it comes from you know, this ministry or that ministry, whether it's anchored on a five-year plan or a 30-year plan, but everyone had one. There wasn't a country that said, okay, we don't need a policy for that. But this valuation is rarely trans translated into policy to support the family farms that are central to agricultural community. Yeah. So, I promised you that I'll be checking if you're awake. So here's the first clicker exercise. What makes agricultural problems so complex? Is it A, that technologies used in agriculture are more sophisticated than ever before? Is it B, that problems tend to be multidimensional, multi-level, and involve multiple actors? Is it C, that most problems are linked with climate change, which has brought about complex changes in agricultural ecosystems? Or is it D, that each problem requires multidisciplinary research to discover a solution? And we have about 14 replies. 20 replies. The last fence sitters. Yes, so the majority of the room got it correctly. Yes, so it's problems tend to be multidimensional, multi-level, and involve multiple actors. That is the heart and soul of the complexity in agricultural innovation systems. Let's try it again. Which one of these situations do not represent a disconnect in the agricultural production base? So I'm asking which one does not? Is it A, degraded soils requiring high, higher level of fertilizer inputs? Is it B, a distrust between consumers and producers? Is it C, a strong cultural roots in a country's agricultural heritage? Or is it D, saline intrusion and beach erosion resulting from unprecedented frequencies of storm surges? Which is not a disconnect. Okay, so we have a more interesting answer here. In this case, the, the correct answer would be C. Would someone who answered C like to say why they answered C? So, 
So, strong cultural roots in your agricultural heritage is not a disconnect per se. You know, it can be something very positive. This particular, this particular crop is grown here throughout the years. That's part of our cultural heritage. That's not a disconnect per se. All the others are examples of what happens when you have a disconnect. Okay, and one more. When we say that complex agricultural problems are multidimensional, what do we mean? Do we mean that they require input at national, regional, local, and sometimes a global level? B, that they demand involvement of multiple actors to achieve resolution? C, that they involve a range of agricultural products? Or D, that they are an interplay of biophysical, technical, sociocultural, economic, and political factors? Very interesting. So, the, the answer here was B, but D can also be taken as a, as a multidimensional answer. Okay, let's continue on. But I think, uh, I think the stage has been set in terms of uh, attentiveness requirements, right? Okay. So, um, when we look at the complexity of agricultural problems, we want to make sure that the solutions that we come up with will meet all of the dimensions that we talked about, the levels and the stakeholder needs and the inferences which often need to be addressed separately before we bring them together. And there are multiple factors behind complexity. Let me briefly um, touch on four. One is that they are at the interplay of biophysical, technical, socio-cultural, economic, <clears throat> institutional and political factors. Two is that they have very different implications across different levels. So some might be at a global level, at a national level, and some might be at a local or subnational level. They are further ca characterized by the involvement of multiple actors and stakeholders. And finally, the development of the problem and the efficiency and effectiveness of the solutions is uncertain and often unpredictable. So we work under a lot of uncertainty with a lot of actors at various levels who come from different angles. And all of these factors coming together are the perfect storm that drives this complexity. So one of the classic examples that we take to illustrate this complexity is climate change and food security, or the effects of climate change on food security. By, by a show of hands, how many people have not heard climate change and food security mentioned together in some context in the last five years? Right. So we look at rainfall patterns. We, looked at, we can look at um, solutions that look at drought resistance varieties. We can look at a cropping calendar. or We can look at reduced yields and incomes and their effects. We can go into global agreements such as the Kyoto Protocol or carbon credits. We can get into very long debates on who is responsible and who should pay. Yes, who's the polluter. But at the end of the day, it doesn't change the problem itself. Yeah, so we need to find solutions that address all of these factors. There are also... Um, they're also quite complex. I mean, I won't go into, in, for the sake of time, I won't go into all of the examples that are mentioned here. You'll have them. But they're just giving you many examples of how these multi-level interactions requires an interaction across all of these levels. And we have, you know, classic examples like the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change going down all the way to, and then you have a regional one like the SADC climate change. SADC is the South, Southern African community. Um, then it can be at a national level, such as Kenya, the Kenya National Climate Change Response Strategy. And then it can be at a farmer level. So mitigation and adopt, adaptation strategies. 
For example, here in this photo, rainwater harvesting. So across all of this, we see the two layered arrows. And that's very important to, to bear in mind. It's not a one-way stream. So information and sometimes resources flow um, bottom-up as well. So multi-stakeholder platforms they or partnerships, they don't only bring key stakeholders together to discuss policy issues, but they also foster the sharing of skills and innovation. They promote inclusivity and equity, promote grassroots mobilization and participation, and they help us develop trust amongst the groups who can be sometimes very suspicious and sometimes even hostile towards each other. So in a typical uh, multi-stakeholder partnership, we can find policymakers, civil society, development actors, donors, farmers, the private sector, consultants, researchers. None of these stakeholder groups can solve the complex problem of on their own. That's usually why we call them sort of wicked problems, because you can't just get together in a small group of one category of these and solve the problem. I mentioned just a couple of minutes ago that the efficiency of solutions is uncertain and unpredictable. So the development of the problem over time cannot be foreseen. We can't always know in advance how quickly um, things will unfold. The type of solutions and some of the external um, negativity, negative externalities um, so, or undesired impacts and how they will work out. We also don't know how the stakeholder interactions will, will work out. Just because you get people into a room together doesn't mean you're going to have a great outcome come out of it. It also depends a lot on what stage of your policy process or po policy formulation you're in. As most of this room comes from a government policy background, you know that very well. So if you're at a stage where, you know, the top political authority, the uh, prime minister or the president or the minister of your ministry is absolutely keen on getting something done, it's a very different type of engagement intensity than if it's something that you're exploring for maybe in the future. In terms of climate change and food security, going back to that, the big questions that we have is how will climate change develop over time? And what type of climate change adaptation and mitigation strategies will be most effective? And will different type of stakeholders continue to work together? So these are simple, easy questions, right? So how will climate change evolve over time? there's an increase in greenhouse gases and then there's an increase in corresponding increase in temperature. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So how will it increase over time? Will it, uh, will it, are we heading to a two degree warmer world or a four degree warmer world or 1.5 or will the world get colder? Who has the answer? Can you tell me exactly how many hectares will be deforested in the next 12 months? Not so sure about that. These are impossible questions to answer. Impossible. Forgive me for asking you impossible questions. The issue here is that if we had answers to these, the problems wouldn't be so complex. Yeah? We can take our best modelers and our best scientists and make all the assumptions in the world, um, but then something that we haven't factored will completely overturn this upside down. It can be a natural disaster. It can be a political change. It can be, you know, a man-made or a person-made disaster. So all of these things can, can derail. We can suddenly have a key stakeholder pull out. Imagine, you know, the private sector decides tomorrow that climate change isn't really happening, you know, and so on and so forth. So these are hugely complex issues that we simply don't know how it will affect. 
So what's the solution? Do we do nothing? Does somebody have a policy paper from their own government that says our strategy is to do nothing? You laugh, and, and it seems a, an irrational thing to do, but when we look at the results of some of the policies over the years, that might actually win, would have been a good strategy in some of the cases. We'll just do nothing and wait and see. Yeah? And so the typical solution that we hear is, uh, okay, so then we need innovation. Innovation will solve the problem. We'll have to unpack that a bit more to see whether innovation is always the answer and what is innovation. Um, but basically, we see a lot of solution strategies with attention to an integrated analysis across various dimensions or we see solutions that advocate for interaction across the multiple levels. Or we will often hear and say time and again that it's very important to get different stakeholders group paying attention to gender and age and ethnic groups and so on and so forth. And finally you'll hear, you've heard already in the morning, capacity to innovate and the flexibility and adaptive capacity so that we can respond to whatever life um, throws at us because we can't be sure what we're going to deal with like we just saw with these few simple questions. So before we move on, what do you think about that? What do you think about the main premise that Stephen puts forward that it's the connectedness, the increase in connectivity that's going to increase the rate. Does that resonate with you? Do you agree? Do you disagree? I'd love to hear someone who agrees and someone who disagrees, if we have them. There's no right or wrong answer here. Does somebody agree? Is there a microphone on your table? Yeah, I, I agree that uh, all of us are interconnected and uh, there are platforms where we can interchange or exchange ideas. but. Uh, also, it's, a, it's also a reality that, for example, Facebook gives us so many distractions while we are at it, right? So I'm thinking of uh, linking this idea of connect, connectedness to a certain KM tool that we, be, we, we were introduced recently called Communities of Practice, Online Communities of Practice, so, right. Okay, thank you very much for that. Do we have someone who feels maybe not the opposite but is leaning towards the other side that too much connectivity is actually hampering innovation, not, not fostering it? Should have had a clicker exercise on this, right? Yes, but the fact that we don't have any is, is actually pretty consistent. When, you, when I talk with people from many walks of life, the general sense that I get from groups is that, yeah, no, more, more interactions, more connectivity, it does help us innovate, it does help us come up with new ways of doing things. And so that's maybe a take home for us to take with us. So spaces for creativity is one big part of what is advocated for as good prerequisites for innovations to emerge. Bringing different people to mingle and the different people is important. Maybe the fact that we don't have any NGO representatives here today is going to hamper our innovation strategies. And when you go back to the ministries, you know, you're going to say, ah, you know, there's a gap here. I have a blind spot because I didn't have someone from the civil society close to the ground come and share their reality. He talked a lot about finding the missing piece because often, you know, we have many pieces of the puzzle already. We're not starting from scratch. We have, in many cases, dozens of years of experience to build on. But sometimes it's just that this one thing that comes and suddenly becomes a game changer. And these processes take time. That's often something that we talked about uh, three disconnects. A fourth disconnect would be donor funding cycles or government funding cycles and the natural time for innovations. So often these things can take 10, 15 years for a real breakthrough to happen. 
but funded through, you know, three-year cycles, sometimes with stops in between, and so on. So these are things to, to bear in mind on the emergence of innovations. So I'd like to invite you to participate in a role play, if you agree. I will take the silence as tacit agreement. So, central in our role play is a big forest. We talked about deforestation a few minutes ago. So here is an example. It's a huge forest that is located in between two expanding cities. For lack of a better world, we'll call one Addis and the other Ababa. And they're part of a region that we'll call the Highlands region. Several are from small farming communities who are living in and around the forest. For their livelihood strategy, they rely on small agricultural activities and from gathering natural resources provided by the forest, for example, firewood. As the cities are expanding and land is becoming more scarce, there is a debate about whether to keep the forest as it is and if not, what are the costs and benefits of different scenarios? So let me give you a few scenarios. One of the options would be to keep the forest like it is. No change to the current situation. There is unique fauna and flora in this area. The forest connects two other natural reserves and people from the, both cities come there to relax, to walk, and do sports. Another option would be to cut down the forest and develop houses and industry so that the two cities will become one mega city. Another option is to cut down the forest, but instead use it for agricultural purposes, and that can supply the region with food. And a fourth one is to do the same, but use it not for food, but for rubber or coffee, pr coffee production, which will create, can create much needed cash, for example, biofuels and so on. Maybe you already have a preference. It's possible that based on the information I gave, you already have a preference. Quite possible. That's often how it works in practice. So when you go into a meeting, you don't go as a blank slate. You bring your experience and your biases and your predispositions with you. And that's all, always the case. So such debates often end up on a negotiating table. Yeah? So we'll have people who represent the various stakeholders group. Now, any such group can bring together a multi-stakeholder process. So we'll bring everyone around the table and we'll have a seat. This will be our multi-stakeholder platform and we'll discuss these options. So what often happens is that this group comes up with suggestions. We'll have the advocates of the various groups and we'll start discussing. can also come to a conflict, yes? You have that option available to you today. If you want to storm out of the room, you are free to do so. Sometimes people will change their minds and alliances will be created. Feel free to create alliances. And sometimes solutions are arrived at. Only time will tell if the solution is a good one or not. So here's the role division, and I'd like you to, if possible, try to be in groups of five. So if you can merge into groups of five, that would be good. And there will be different roles. You can be the government representative, in this case the mayor. You can be a private sector representative. You can be a farmer representative. You can be a nature conservatist representative or you can be a platform facilitator. And I'll hand out sheets that give you a little bit of a briefing about each of the roles 
and what you feel and think as that role. So, the starting point is that this is your first platform meeting. Your objective is to discuss the future of the forest with, amongst all the stakeholders. If you pick the role of the facilitator, you're supposed to lead the meeting and facilitate it, as the name suggests. In some groups, <coughs> not all roles will be represented. In other groups, there may be more than farmer represented. It's okay if you end in such groups. Yeah? Feel free to create them. We will have two platform meetings of 10 minutes. Yeah? So far, is everything clear? Are you ready to split into the groups and have your first meeting on the topic? Okay, so as you do that, I'll walk around the tables and I'll hand you over a short one-page handout that gives a bit of context and then another handout that gives the different roles. So you can already pick your roles, think about which role you want to be, yeah? And I'll come over and then the facilitator should lead you through the process. You'll have 10 minutes and then we'll convene back in the plenary before we go into round two, okay? You can pick your role first and then read a bit more about it. Here's a description of the roles. Once you pick a role, you can just take that page and give the others to others. So this is a description of the roles for somebody else, okay? okay. I'll invite you to start talking soon because we only have six <laughs> minutes left. Can I have everyone's attention back? The meeting room has been flooded and you have to walk outside immediately. You cannot continue with the meeting. It's, it's great to see the passion, but the minister convened a meeting <laughs> and we can no longer continue our side group. Okay. Okay, let's, let's try to be all together for a minute. I'll just go around now very, very quickly and ask for the emerging dynamics and decisions from the different groups. I know you are under unreasonable time pressure and you didn't have time to do all the roles and everything. That's okay. I would still like to get just a general sense of where we are. So the table that's speaking will get to speak first. Please go ahead. What is your overall feedback for us, dear facilitator? We look at uh, how our role is, no? Okay, given the, the four, one, two, three, four, five, three, four, four roles. And then um, upon our assessment of our, each of our individual roles, the mayor stood up and he said uh, he's willing to converse, to consult with the stakeholders and uh, that uh, the stakeholders agree with the suggestion of the mayor and that uh, the suggestion, uh, it came out that the, the decision is a win-win solution that everybody could benefit in terms of the forest could be part of the forest that is uh, good for plantation, could be devoted some of it, some would be for agriculture but uh, there has to be an analysis related to how the urban, how land would be converted into urban uh, area. So you have, you're leaning towards... So we had four options, remember? Right? We could, number one, leave the forest alone. We could, number two, convert it into housing and industry. We could, number three, use it for agriculture for producing food, or we could use it for agriculture for producing money. Yeah? Cash crops or biofuels. So you're leaning towards partially number three, if I understand correctly. Agricultural use. Yes. And is it agricultural use for producing food that would be consumed in the community or sold for money? 
Okay, so you're partially towards number three. Thank you very much. Group one. Group two. utilize the forest with the uh, source as a source of income with um, a fruit tree fruit mm -hmm. tree so but the uh, conservationist uh, she insisted to to preserve the the forest as a jungle as a jungle <laughs> so that uh, the flora the fauna will be uh, preserved there but uh, as a benefit for the farmers for the community nearby the forest uh, they will be uh, attract the forest will attract the tourists mm -hmm. so it it could be, uh, it can be a uh, ecotourism that mm -hmm. developed there. And fortunately, the uh, private sector, the private so, sector. Sorry, please, can we all be together? When the colleagues are speaking, can we all be together, please? The private Thank sector, you. the business women here are uh, eager and willing, happily to uh, finance how the ecotourism uh, system uh, running well. So the mayor uh, happy with that because in his opinion uh, the forest must be productive but he also insisted that the forest not to be destroyed. Dear facilitator, and what is the convergence of your group? Yes. Have, you, have you reached any decision? Yes. Which so option have you chosen? So we, we have a forest that uh, built as a ecotourism. Okay, so you're going for mostly option number one, leaving the forest as it is and creating an ecotourism system around it. Yeah. Thank you very much. Group number three. For gr group number three, uh, the strategy that we uh, we we follow this uh, first uh, considering the the different roles uh, we have uh, uh, i we uh, we ask each uh, uh, group or stakeholders to explain the reasons why uh, what is their position what is their objective i'm going to jump start the process and say what decision you arrived at yeah, okay. And then after that, uh, on the part of the platform facilitator, I offered them that this is, you know, when we talk of agricultural, sustainable agriculture, we need the participation of everybody. N nobody can, can play that role of developing a sustainable agriculture. Mm -hmm. And therefore, when I ask them uh, to, to play the role vis-a-vis uh, -vis the concept of, you know, uh, agritourism and, or green developing of a green city, mm -hmm. uh, of course, there, uh, within the green city, there is such thing as agritourism. <laughs> when we talk about agritourism, it involves so many services food production, services, manufacturing, and so forth, so on and so forth. So we agreed that uh, we maintain the forest, we will develop that to become a green city. Okay, and the so mayor was so happy because everybody is, is satisfied. So and you will, also he will opted, come up with a policy. So you also opted or you're leaning towards option one, maintaining the forest as it is and developing an ecotourism uh, activity around it. That's correct. Okay, thank you very much, group three. Group four, please. Uh, this is actually what had transpired with the meeting. So, um, after the meeting, we uh, opted to, to convert, not to convert, but to develop and utilize the forest area into an agro-ecotourism site, mm -hmm. and then promoting ag organic agriculture and, 
maintaining the fauna and flora, so utilizing only the periphery for agriculture, mm -hmm. but maintaining the forest as it is. So, of course, these are, the meeting was represented by different stakeholders. So, from the government agencies, from the private agencies, and then the um, nature conservationists, and of course, the mayor. Thank, Thank you, you very much. So, we have here an interesting mix. We said that there's a problem with deforestation. If you were the policy makers and actors involved in the world, we wouldn't have such a problem because three out of the four groups are primarily concerned with maintaining the forest so far, yes? I'd like you to think, if you're some of the other stakeholders, think hard whether you would accept it as easily, you know, to give away more housing when people don't have places to live, or to give away on an industry that can bring in so much money, but it needs the space, or producing more food when people don't have enough by having more agriculture, or producing cash crops, yeah? So all of these are real competitors. But for now we have, this is the situation. Now, between your first and second meeting, something happened. So a scientific research report has been published by ICRAF. ICRAF is the World Agroforestry Organization. Um, ICRAF reports includes a cost-benefit analysis that sustainable rubber production is most beneficial for the region. Yeah? Where would sustainable rubber production fit? Option one, two, three, or four? Okay. Are you gonna consume the rubber? Are you gonna eat the rubber? No, you will sell it. So that would be option four. So you're doing agriculture in order to get funds. Yeah? So a scientific report by a world leading scientific organization in the field comes up has been made available to you and says option four, if done sustainably, could be the most beneficial for the region. A month goes by and your group meets again to discuss. Please take the next 10 minutes and discuss again with this additional information that's available to you. Please try to be as real as possible. Yeah. As someone who works for a research organization, I know how seriously or not they are taken by policymakers at all of their meetings, yes? So please be realistic. So your second meeting starts now. We agreed that uh, we will uh, respect the recommendation of ICRA because rubber is a high value crop giving high income to planters or to farmers. But we also agreed that uh, we have to maintain part of the forest uh, as part of uh, the watershed and that would provide a very good ecosystem. And therefore we agreed that we are going to pursue an agroforestry system wherein we can still pr uh, produce food <coughs> integrated with uh, the rubber because we have to secure food of uh, people, especially the, especially the small holders. So we have to secure food, we have to increase income, and uh, again, the mayor is very much happy to, to hear that. <laughs> very good, thank you very much. Yes, please. Our, our previous group number one. Okay. So this group has been analyzing the situation through land use planning. And um, when they analyze, um, facilitated the, the group's uh, discussion, 
they, um, all of them, each one of them cited that rubber plantation production is not really beneficial to their own countries. Indonesia, Thailand, Cambodia, and the Philippines. It's not really beneficial. So that they have their knowledge about um, it as not really will not be benefiting the, the farmers because uh, firstly, their choice is about or their decision is for producing agricultural products. And so the, the stakeholders will stick to their own plan, still the, the plan, original plan. Wonderful. Thank you very much. So we uh, agree with the ECRAF report about uh, sustainable rubber production. And also, coincidentally, uh, it turn out, turn out that the ecotourism uh, didn't attract as many tourists as we expect before. So the community uh, lack of gas. So we agree to do the sustainable rubber production, but then the uh, conservationists uh, make the government to gave a policy that uh, only limited part of the forest that will uh, change to the rubber tree, rubber plantation. And uh, the conservationists also uh, propose uh, a system that uh, not the plantation not in one place, but rather than uh, such as intercropping. So the rubber plantation, uh, the rubber, we, uh, the community get the cash from the rubber uh, that will export it by the private sector. And also government will uh, support with some uh, finance to finance the, to make sure that uh, it is uh, ecologically safe. Something like that. Thank you very much. And our final group? Uh, since uh, the project for the rubber production has already a cost-benefit analysis, and then uh, the, the finding is already sustainable and the most beneficial for the region, I think uh, the, the consolidated uh, action of the group would be uh, to go for rubber production, but of course, we will not be compromising the total area for rubber production. We have to devote at least an area also for for the useful activities of the farmers. We will have to conserve uh, to preserve also the area to maintain the the, uh, the fauna and the flora. And then, of course, the, as uh, what we had agreed a while ago for the first session. So we have the uh, agro tourism site and the maintenance of the organic agriculture. Sure. Thank you very much. Okay, so on, on behalf of ICRAF, I'd like to thank all the groups for taking its report so seriously. As someone who works for a CG Center, I can assure you that that's normally how it works. We don't just issue a report and, you know, policymakers and civil society and the private sector just, you know, rush over to implement it instantly. It's important to also think about these things critically. You know, it's nice to have these fun and games, and the process, the discussions, are very valuable. But we need to be true to ourselves and remain very critical. Yes? What if I were to tell you that, you know, the richest family in the area who are very connected to the mayor, they want to develop housing estates there? Does that change what, uh, what your groups might have thought? Yeah? These are, these are all kinds of things that we take into account. We spent the morning discussion how these things are very complex. They are also very unpredictable. Yeah? We cannot forget stakeholder groups. In uh, group two, for example, the nature conser conservative, you know, got a very strong say. You know? They would also love to be in that position normally. Like ICRAF, they're also very grateful. Yeah? These are the sort of things we need to be very critical about when we think of these. Another thing is, 
there's no doubt that, uh, and I think group two said it as well, on the assumption that the ECROF report is valid, so we'd like to believe that it's valid, but do you know the expression, when all you have is a hammer, every problem looks like a nail? Yeah? So, if your entire career is researching rubber, what are you going to write your report about? Rubber. And what is the cost-benefit going to say? Rubber is good. Yeah? It's not that the report isn't valid, but it's that there could be other trade-offs. Yeah? So we always have to look at triangulation and all of these things and remain very critical when we, when we enter these discussions. But what is important, it was nice to see it across all groups, all groups actually were open to change their views based on new information. That's fantastic. That's the best case scenario. But we have to remember that in real life, many people will not change their mind. You know? Sometimes there's also another saying, if your job depends on you not understanding something, the best explanations in the world will not work. Yeah? So we always have to remember that there may be other interests that don't want to hear it. Yeah? And how do we engage in those difficult conversations? The conversations that I heard at least were very civil. Yeah? We didn't have any, any one person aiming to sort of uh, dictate to others and so on. But in reality, we can find a very strong stakeholder group that will not budge. Says, no, any change to the current situation would mean I lose whatever it is, money, power, influence, and so on. So I will not budge, whatever you tell me, whatever the ECROF report says. Yeah? So we have to always remember these dynamics. Okay, I am running very much behind time, and I'm conscious that we need to break for lunch now. So what I will do is I will just very briefly show some of the other slides, but I will not cover them. The reason I want to show them to you is because you will recognize many of the concepts and frameworks that Bernie had presented earlier. Yeah? And looking at that, from technology transfer to food safety to AKIS to AIS. Yeah? So you have triangulation here that, you know, these sources are working and some of the barriers. So all of these, all of these um, concepts will be available to you in the PowerPoints. They will be sent to you um, each day at the end. So you can go over them, you can look at the list of sources, yeah? And if there are any questions, you can also see me. But in the interest of time, I won't cover them now so that we can break for lunch. And with that, Sel, can I hand it back over to you for... Thank you very much.